Hello, good morning, good afternoon to all the viewers and attendees of this session. Welcome to the Horasis Asia meeting. And the topic of discussion is absorbing young Asian graduates in work. Hi, I'm Raji Raghunath, Managing Director of Wellverse Media India, a company that is into business research and communications. And I have with me my co-panelists who are eminent, experienced experts on the subject. And we're very fortunate to have their presence here for this discussion. Let me introduce Mr. Nalin Singh, co-founder and CEO of Orbit Future Academy India. Of course, he is currently uh, based in Jakarta. Let me introduce Dr. Itsan Itsan, advisor, PT Avina Synergy International Indonesia. Itsan is an extremely multifaceted person who has experience in the energy sector and has is a great speaker and expert on the subject of human resources as well. I have great pleasure in welcoming Ms. Tiu Yen Trin, founder and CEO of TalentNet Vietnam. Welcome, lady and gentlemen, to this session. It's an extremely interesting subject, and the subject gains tremendous significance in the times that we all are living in in this world, which is a pandemic-impacted world, where there have been sweeping changes, not only on the corporate landscape, but in the way that people have to adjust to the new normal. And in adjusting to the new normal, the one big segment that is called upon to shoulder great responsibilities for today and for tomorrow would be the young graduates. So talking about the young graduates, there are in the entire Asian region, there are millions of uh, young people who are graduating out of educational institutions and preparing for their long careers in, the, in their respective chosen areas of specialization. Our experts will be talking, taking us through the different facets of that preparation, how organizations will have to prepare for absorbing the young workforce and how the young workforce will have to be preparing for the jobs of the future. So what I would do is that I will straight away get down to the discussions. I will have a few questions that I'd like to present to our experts and have their observations so straight away. Today, as we are looking at the in domestic, at the national economies, retracing the growth path as we recover from this uh, the pandemic, the key question is that are you are we seeing a discernible change in the employment trends? Are we seeing any significant changes in the job creation in the Asian region? And for that, first of all, I'd like to go to Nalin and have his observations on what are the job creation trends that you're seeing happen on the Asian landscape? And if you could comment particularly in regard to the economies where you are actually doing your business and operations. Over to you, Nalan. Thanks, Rajiv. So we operate primarily in Indonesia and uh, we are a company that provides skills for future jobs. Few trends that are taking place, you know, out of all the graduates passing out in Asia, India, China, and Indonesia contribute about 40% of that. Actually, they contribute 40% globally. And in Asia, they're closer to 80%. For graduates passing out, there are six clear trends that universities and job uh, givers should be ca careful about and view it carefully. One, there are fewer jobs in the private sector due to automation, artificial intelligence, etc., which was even happening pre-pandemic. -pre Two, the governments are across the world are going in for minimum government, maximum governance, which means they are hiring fewer people. So private sector is not hiring. Government is not hiring. Third, students don't see the value of these time consuming degrees. If students today are smarter and work faster, they don't see the sense of why a three year degree still takes three years and isn't faster. And they also see that the most qualified person that they know is the person teaching them and they don't want to be like their teachers. That's not their aspiration. Fourth, out the two things that have become most expensive among what we need in life, like food, clothing, shelter, health, education, and uh, the communication, what has become most expensive in our lifetimes is medicine and education, disproportionately so. Medicine is understandable because you walk into a hospital and it looks different from what it was 30 years ago. 
but you walk into a university it looks the same as it was 30 years ago so why is it costing 20 times more fifth social media has made people restless impatient and independent and finally covid has shown that the quality of education whether you go to a big place or a small place a huge place or a well branded place or a new university it ultimately depends on who is teaching and how and not which university you went to so if you put these six things together and you will realize that the young people of today are really really in a very disadvantaged position they are paying more they don't aspire for that degree it is taking the same amount of time jobs have shrunk and they are impatient and restless for something else we really need to figure out how we will treat them wonderful i think your uh, observations are tremendous insightful and forward looking and it calls for a lot of action i would like to go to itsan and get his perspectives on the subject of what are the job creation trends that you're seeing and also the employment opportunities more specifically it's if you could just throw light on some of the frontline industries where you yourself are engaged in with regard to renewable energy and areas like that which are really the sectors of the future which also would secure a better planet for the people of the world so it's on over to you yep thank you rajiv i think the trend uh, especially also in in indonesia and also asia that uh, people uh, the youngsters are have more concern on the climate change also uh because that's also on their gene that the uh, youngsters uh, have a uh, uh, they have a uh, more knowledge and uh, our uh, like uh, me and also the previous uh, baby boomers they they learn and they would like to know uh, actually that uh, for example if a company uh, they will not apply to the company if the company not uh interested on the climate change and they will see also not only the company but also the person behind it so for example who is the ceo of, of shell who is the ceo of the chevron and so on are they concerned about the uh, climate change and so on so that's uh, from uh, my experience uh in indonesia and i also actively um do the coaching for the startups in indonesia about 300 startups we did together also with awina and then Uh, we have uh, more concerns also on how to deliver the young generations to be able to take over the jobs of their seniors and in this perspective that uh, the the jobs uh, positions also change they are more concerned on the startups and when they enter a company uh, they probably not uh, really uh, have a more consistent uh, work they would like to be more active they would like to be more innovative on on that So that's a uh, I think from my perspective fantastic it's on I think very interesting points that I think we will that will come up in uh, the course of our discussion as we progress I'd like to quickly go to Trin Trin actually you are organize you run a business where you are really dealing with talent you know the organization itself is uh, you know bears that name uh, Trin uh, uh, how would you think that the trends would change as we enter what is still our pandemic times but the world is already talking about a post covid scenario and uh, nalin has already alluded to the situation of uh, job creation not happening in the private sector like before and also the accent on degrees are far lesser than what is being taught and who is being who is teaching right so uh, trend your perspectives are very important and you are based in vietnam a extremely dynamic country of a lot of young people so let us have your views on what are the discernible trends good question thank you raziz so i'm lucky to work in uh, human resource and people development so i'm very see the trend it change a lot there are two respect one in terms of the corporate the company right we have to re- with the impact we have to move faster and change the way of management before you can have the shape of triangle high ranking but now we move more on project based and circle more and circle and lead the it not just the control and order but lead the it to facilitate the way and power more for people and create the environment more agile agile it mean doesn't mean in terms of office home office or uh, at home or at office but also agile in terms of the way up we manage people authorize empower a uh, blessy benefit blessy on the agile thing and put the employee become the center 
of the organization. When we set up the new policy to revive to hybrid working, we have to listen the voice from employees, what they are contact, what is really need. So we redesign again the home. And the way we use the workforce very different. Before that, we can use full-time employee within organization between the key workforce to achieve to support for business strategy and strategy. But now we can see more one internal marketplace and the other external marketplace. It means we can look at many channel external market, robotic chatbot in one of the channel of resource, right? Internship student from university is one of very good resource. Part-time and freelancer, one of the resource. And cooperation, mm-hmm. alliance, partnership. We, we, we have looked at overview picture about our business model, how we change our business model. From there, what is the indication for strategic work for planning, overview of your organization, and then buy strategy, build strategy, and borrow strategy coming. Which work for is the best efficiency for your organization? So you focus on that. So in that context, you more agile and flexible to select the best workforce that fit with your need and support the business, right? And in the context of that, employee become the center when you engage them, facilitate. And the, the young talent expect very different from before. For the baby boomer, for all the uh, generation, they expect the good environment, career development, and reward, compensation, recognition, that's it. But now very different. The young talent expect, I mean, what is agile, more hybrid working, more than 50% of the talent, they like hybrid working, right? They like purpose, like meaningful work to support for the, to bring the value, added value for the organization, for the consumer, for the communities. They care about safety and well-being, health, well-being. And they really engage and they like flexible. Yeah. So sometimes that is the business model. We engage full-time resource with external market resource. We engage startup with the organization as well. Let the employee to do not full-time 100%, but they can do back up the job of the company, but they can do other as well. Right. So that kind of mindset is very important that we, we change the way we work and the way we manage people and the way we cooperate. And that is really very good opportunities. All right. Fantastic, Trina. I think you've touched upon some very important aspects while you also talked about the need for business models to adjust to the new normal. You are also touched upon what would indeed be the expectations of the young workforce that would enter the work. It's not just about the role or the or the or perhaps the salary. It's a lot more. They are looking at the value systems. They are looking at the purpose of the organizations. Very, very important points indeed. So I think uh, we had touched upon the first aspect of the trends and expectations. I think our, I was very happy that you know we have uh, extremely diverse set of uh, points uh, taken up and some in very interesting recommendations as well. Uh, I'll get to the second point and in fact this was something that Nalin had alluded to when he made his, uh, when you made your interventions and you said that you know in these times when uh, you know new technologies are being you know, applied in organizations they would necessarily have a visible impact on the employment patterns. You mentioned about new technologies. I would actually that would, that would be my question to the panel here is that with increasing automation, the application of things like artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, the whole work landscape is had been changing. And this is not a post-COVID scenario. This had been happening for the last five years and more. I'd like to have your perspectives on what is really the impact of the application of new technologies and automation on the engagement of young workforce in the organizations. Now, I'd like you to come in first on this one. So, you know, Rajiv, uh, it's a good point you brought up. Uh, we, we are supposed to be in Industry 4.0. The difference is when we move from Industry 1, 2, and 3.0, the time difference was huge, and it allowed people to get reskilled, and workforce was largely not as impacted as in Industry 4.0, which is leading to mass job losses. People are not able to redeploy quickly and learn machine learning and AI. 
That's one problem. The other is industry wants workforce ready people, which means they don't just want the technical skill. They don't value the degree as much as you can see so many large corporations now hiring people without a degree qualification. But they want people who have not only the technical skill, but have the other skills, life skills, soft skills, have compassion, empathy, design, things like that. And one shining example of that, one shining example of that is Indonesia, which appointed a unicorn founder as its education minister out of the blue. And every correct course that we do for them, they have a huge mass reskilling program never before seen in the world, where people from campus are studying in private universities like ours, getting credits for that. And it is compulsory for us to have 50% of our course teaching character building elements oh, like wow. compassion, empathy, the, the listening skills, communication skills, life skills. I cannot teach artificial intelligence without 50% of the curriculum being on these aspects. Absolutely. Unless, unless the education systems adopts all this, industry will not hire these graduates or will have to retrain them, reskill them, add these elements and have huge internship programs, which costs a lot of money. Our education system has to transform to industry 4.0. We need education 4.0. And unless that happens, these graduates are not going to get employed. We are going to create entrepreneurs by compulsion, not choice. They are being forced into entrepreneurship, which as, as far as we all know, is a 90% failure scheme in the first two years. We are forcing our youth into this 90% failure scheme because they're not employable. Oh, very, very important point. And I think your suggestion about education 4.0 is so important. And along with that, you touched upon life skills. Uh, it's um, uh, yours is uh, many of the sectors that you're looking at, the application of technology had always been there. And progressively automation would become you know, the way in which these businesses are going to be run. Uh, let us have your perspectives on the net impact of automation on employment creation. And of course, one very important point that Nalin, that you just mentioned is that it is important to have entrepreneurship by choice and not by compulsion. So also keeping in view those aspects, we really like to have your views on uh, the way forward. Yeah, thank you, Rajiv. I think what uh, Trin uh, said is also uh, interesting that uh, also in Indonesia, that uh, people tends to, uh, the youngster tends to find their own job that match with their patience, compassion, and also enthusiasm. So in that case, most of the time, uh, somehow they could not find it, and they start their own company. They they build a startup companies, and they uh, attract more youngsters to join with them, and they get more funding from venture capitalists. They got more funding from impact investors. And this create a new type of business model that uh, is not happening with the conventional companies. They have their different uh, segments. They have their market acquisitions. They have the uh, market uh, place. They have their market product. And so it's totally different than uh, when my time and maybe uh, when uh, other people here uh, time. So with that challenge, uh, uh, they need uh, additional support, which is the automations, machine learning, IoT, and so on, because they are, it is more matched with their generations. When we talk about, for example, like CO2 emissions, CO2 emissions in the past cannot uh, done properly because it's a, there are double counting on that. And with the new system, with the blockchain, it is possible. So it helps a lot with the, uh, to support the conventional business and when they create the social entrepreneurship, it also brings uh, more value to the uh, climate change, more value to the community service and so on. And this will attract also conventional companies like a big giant oil and gas companies to, to think more about not only CSR, but more to the CSP type of models. And this will create also a good synergy between the job creations and also the uh, community support, as well as the environmental impact. So in that case, I think that a lot of uh, engagement is changing. Of course, it will reduce some uh, job opportunities. But on the other hand, the job, uh, the job value and all the job variations is also becomes more and more. So in the past, we don't know, for example, uh, a kind of surface, a kind of work that never done before. But now you can see everything is uh, with the, the digital informations and so on. A lot of new 
job variations created. I think that's uh, my perspective, uh, Rajiv. Absolutely. Very, very interesting, very important points you have taken up. Uh, I'd like to go over to Trin and, uh, you know, from the discussion that uh, we have had, it's very, uh, very clear. And I, perhaps uh, we all have observed that the nature of jobs have been changing along with that, with the application of technologies, the expectations from the young work- workforces would have also changed transformed quite significantly. You're at that other side of the spectrum where you're actually channeling the talent to the job roles. What is your understanding of the pre- how well the workforce is prepared to take on these new challenges and fit into the new job roles that are expected of them? Uh, do you think that there are early interventions required before they enter the workforce? Or do the organizations really need to have great induction plan, you know, programs and training such that the young workforce is really geared to deliver on the roles that are expected of them? Mm. I mean, thank you. Thank you, uh, Razi. Uh, I totally agree with uh, um, Nalin and Ishan to sharing about the trend. And over we, we can see it move a lot uh, for the now the requirement from organization focus more on the skill base, not based on the experience or the nature of job, mm-hmm. but based on the skill base. And then let's say uh, the move forward, consider 100% of the workforce internally in organization that is the marketplace, the workforce. Whenever you need any kind of project, you just pull out with the five skill of that project you need. So you have the library, skill library in the company. You can put in and you have the chocolate of the name of the employee that they have capability to do that project. That kind of will coming in, in the few, in the coming time. Yeah. So it means that when you recruit the student, very much at requirement, very much competencies, skill base, very important. Where can adapt? I mean, uh, for innovation, create the value innovation, adjust. Because any rice is coming any time. The difference of this person and the other, that is not experience, but the way how to we handle the problem. How we have the critical thinking to handle the problem. How we have the, to be resilient to overcome the challenge, right? And especially the more you go to the 4.0, it's the more engagement, more empathy, more touch, high touch, but need high touch. Very important. EQ, empathy from the people, uh, come, come to high level, right? So I mean, that, that's why the, the organization also need to make the overview about strategic workforce planning and focus very much on the learning and development agenda, but not only to prepare everything for employee to, to eat it, but we need to engage employee self-learning culture, build the self-learning culture, how adapt, bring the, competent and talented people who are willing to learn, relearn, unlearn, engage, right? And then build them opportunity and have the clear, clear learning development agenda for the workforce, uh, reskill, upskill, digital skill for that kind of future skill to support for the business. Let's say you move your business from traditional channel, move more to online business. It means the workforce shift the competencies from the skill, sales skill in GT, very different from uh, online, right? So you have to shift on the skill workforce of your organization. And it's just not only the skill and reskill of skill, it's about the culture as well. How we have the overview picture in order to shift the workshop, we have to have the people change the mindset, the culture, I mean, digital mindset in whole organization. We could not install on the tool and much, uh, I mean, advance, but the people still don't change the mindset and don't have the digital skill, don't have the clear open mindset, digital agile mindset, cannot run, right? Horn operations. So I think in, 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 the, in focus on learning development, reskill, upskill, and empower, they have to give the chance for opportunity for the fresh student or for the talent to challenge themselves, to bring them uh, out of comfort zone. They can grow, trust them, let them fail, let them learn and grow, right? So that kind of thing should be 
and gay and power more, more really deep inside and understand deeply about your people, your talent, what their passion, what their dream, what their interest. So you can make them into the workforce and give them the right opportunity for them to lift up themselves to grow. Oh, so uh, education is part 10%. But the other 20% is either core learning, uh, sharing and learning with the organization. Uh, 360 degree learning and coaching. The, the, the leaders should learn from the young talent a lot of good things. And the, the young talent also learn from the leaders. And last but not least, 70% that is project, that is assignment, that is the challenge, that is the most important for young people to grow faster and to give them the attraction of the job to retain them. All right. Thank you, Trin. I think there are two uh, important key takeaways are, first of all, you need to create a very collaborative environment within the organization. The organization's culture needs to be geared toward that collaborative way of working. Secondly, of course, it has to be a learning environment in which uh, people should have the opportunity to reskill and redevelop themselves according to the job roles that would be uh, coming up for them. Right. I will now like to go into an area which actually Nalin mentioned earlier about the entrepreneurship by choice rather than by compulsion. Uh, increasingly, as we can see, especially in the Asian uh, sphere, uh, which is uh, more, you know, with the tech led businesses, a huge a swathe of opportunities have come up where young people are not really looking at long term employment engagement. They themselves are actually looking at entrepreneurship entrepreneurial opportunities. Many of the graduates who are coming out of management and technical institutes are already oriented to the entrepreneurship uh, uh, opportunities and would really like to set up their own businesses. So while, of course, on the one side, lack of job creation could actually drive a number of people to actually get into self-employment uh, uh, scenarios, uh, there are indeed uh, young people who are looking to establish their own enterprises, which are very tech led. So I'd like to understand from Nalit that if you are indeed looking at entrepreneurship uh, springing, uh, you know, emerging out of the young workforce, uh, what is the kind of an ecosystem that really helped a very large number of them to get the kind of success and not actually see that kind of 90% failure that you actually mentioned? So. There again, you know, if you see the largest and the most successful entrepreneurship ecosystems in the world, they don't necessarily come from the largest countries. OK, you have very successful entrepreneurship ecosystems in Latvia, Estonia, uh, Singapore, uh, London. If you take it as a small city in itself, Bangalore, people think of India as this big ecosystem. But really, it is just five or six cities. Most of the time it is driven by a very healthy university ecosystem. Okay. And it is the, from there, the ecosystem has various parts, universities, incubators, accelerators, investors, innovation labs. I call it the three I's, uh, innovation labs, industry, and uh, the investors working with uni universities. Only with that, would you create a good ecosystem. And universities have, are the primary source, and they are not equipped to create job creators. They are equipped to create job seekers, which too they are not doing too well right now. So it is an unfair demand on them. Hence, government support them and give them grants, etc. And that's happening in India, that's happening in Indonesia, and a lot of work is happening in that area. But really, the entrepreneurs need to be provided skills. Now, here is how you, we need to think about uh, uh, education. We, we keep hearing all this ed tech, ed tech, ed tech. Think about the poor student and the poor entrepreneur. You're pounding him after eight hours of work, eight hours of study, pounding him with gadgets and all this artificial intelligence and all this edutech uh, software. After all, it is still the same human brain. What are you trying to do? If you look at it, if they need to acquire these skills to be an entrepreneur, you have to think of the whole framework in four parts. Information knowledge, skills, and experience. Of course, it has to be sparked with inner, inner motivation. There's a Sanskrit word called antar prerna, which means inner motivation from which the word entrepreneur came. And if you don't have that, there's nothing else that we can do about it. 
So if you look at these four parts, information, I like to think as what questions, what is this, which Google, YouTube and WhatsApp can do much better. You don't need a professor for that. That is why professors in the classroom are not respected because the mobile phone has more information than what they are providing. Second, for knowledge, you need the why questions answered from which you need somebody, an expert, 10% of the time answering your queries. The third part, when it comes to skills, this is project based learning in a classroom with real projects and life skills thrown in. And finally, the experience part is internships and actually practicing what you have learned. So the problem is universities and ecosystems, even incubators are concentrating too much on the what and the how. Mm -hmm. They think they need to teach the what and the how. The students already know that. It's on their mobile phones. They want to know the why and the what if, which can only come through project and classroom based. The whole percentage of time spent on the what and the how has to inverse with the why and what if, with project based, skill based learning. Till you impart skills, a person walking out of a university, setting up a startup, suddenly needs all the skills that he would need as a CEO, which typically in a company, you become a CEO after 15 to 20 years. We are putting undue pressure on these young people. They need to be imparted these skills. And that will only come through project based experiential learning. Fantastic. Uh, uh, you know, great points um, I, uh, on what that ecosystem ought to deliver rather than only focus on uh, what and how. Uh, it's on. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on the kind of an ecosystem that will actually nurture entrepreneurship in the diverse business sectors, especially if you could just focus on some of the sectors where you and your business are really engaged in? Yeah, I think uh, most of the young entrepreneurs now uh, should be able to follow the the target that uh, also happen in the worldwide, which is the food, energy, and also water. Three of these sectors are really important uh, since uh, uh, 20 years ago, but also till now. So these three uh, sectors will never change. Why food? Because uh, in the near future, we will fight for the food. A lot of the resources missing, and then we have to increase the capability, technology, and also the including the human uh, resource for the food supply and the energy because we also fight for the climate change so therefore we need more uh, uh, green energy and also can also need a train for the uh, new operators and new engineers and also for the uh, new jobs for the uh, green jobs for the water is always the compositions between uh, this is very uh, we, we had in the past for example like for uh, Syria that we fight for the waters and we uh, also have uh, in the past uh, a lot of waters like in the Nile River they fight for the waters so these type of things we never uh, remove in the sectors that need to be concerned on so uh, when when I do uh, also the coaching and also mentoring for uh, my students and also uh, other groups uh, in the incubator uh, uh, business uh, I always emphasize these three things um, because they also know uh, these three uh, sectors are the, the most important uh, in the near future for them also. But the most uh, valuable things that we need to prepare also for the youngster is not only the coaching, but also the mentoring. Mentoring is, is two types of things compared to the coach because coach is like a ad hoc things. So it's a very short period. You, you teach somebody and then uh, stop and that's it. But mentoring is more sustainable way in the long term. And you have uh, your uh, uh, mentor and you also have your uh, uh, people that you train. So it is more a long uh, term on the uh, training ship. And I agree with uh, also uh, uh, Nalin that the, the business engagement is one of the most important things you can you cannot just uh, create uh, entrepreneurship or startup by only providing the uh, seed funding or you get the uh, funding for, for the Series A, Series B uh, or Series C. But you also need uh, the uh, mentality skills and also the business engagements, the business models and also the, uh, uh, the, the innovative cr uh, creative thinking of the, the uh, youngsters that entering there. A lot of uh, startup cannot go anywhere because they just got this a lot of 
tons of the seed money, but they don't have creativity to grow. Mm-hmm. And at the end, they spend all the seed money only for their salary. They get twice or three, even three times higher than the conventional companies. When you ask a, a startup company, they can have a three times or two times higher than commercial company. But the output, it's probably not not the same, and, and it's not uh, very efficient. So what is missing there, I think it's about their patience. I think it's about their creativity. I think what is their innovations there. So they are, I agree with uh, Nalin that they're pushed too hard to be able to take over the job as a CEO, to take over the job as a CEO or CFO when they are not ready there. So uh, this is also the the, the uh, weakness of the digitalization uh, period that like we have now, that they think that they can find everything like a Google. So when you meet Rajiv, for example, that he will ask you like a Google things, and even they have their own software that they ask you, uh, they, they they see you as the person that they can absorb everything from you in a second. So they are, they like to learn, but the way they learn is not the way the same as the conventional way, but they like to learn instantly. And when they do learn instantly, that's a, that's a big uh, challenge there, that they also cannot keep up what is, uh, because it's learn education is something like a process. You cannot get uh, the knowledge you cannot get the professionalism only by instant way. I think that's my perspective. Very, very interesting uh, points that you have taken up. Uh, it's, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of action points there and would be very, very beneficial. To- uh, Razi, can I add two things for the startup? Because I advise yes. many startups. Yes. Yes. And I see three areas, the startup missing. That is first, they are very good in innovation, ID and product, but they don't have the clear strategy. That is very important, clear strategy. What is the end game in three years, five years? You see on the stakeholder, sales marketing strategy, all related. Okay. Right? They focus on product and ID. The second part, that is the partnership strategy. Because they start, so they need to look at our external market. With resource, with channel, we can leverage each other competitive advantage to create the value, right? And the first one that is corporate governance, the company, the management, the human development, human resource. That area they're missing. They just have very technical engineering team, product development, excellent. But they don't have any other resource to deliver the, the service or solution to the customer, to the marketplace, right? That kind of missing. So I think uh, to move forward, uh, how we leverage uh, the corporate, the enterprise, private sector can leverage the startup and the resource. When you like to do something for your own organization, you don't need to build from zero by yourself. You can look at and hunt the startup resource. They okay. can do on behalf of you. And even they, you can build a business model, bring startup into, sit in your office, offer them the, the seat and location facilities. They can help you a number of projects. So that is the both way you can help the startup, but of course you have yourself as well. So I think that is very interesting result for the future. The That's coordination true. between startup and enterprise, private sector, work very strongly together as partners. Wonderful. I think you yes. once again touched upon the extreme need for a collaborative approach. And I think your idea about startup resources is a very, very powerful one. Uh, I think we are uh, coming very close to the end of this uh, session. And I'd like to quickly once again ask uh, Trin to have her intervention on the, you know, whether we can actually look at a much more a collaborative way of uh, workforce management, workforce development at the Asia level. After all, this is a Horasis Asia meeting, and I think it'd be very interesting to have a perspective at a regional level uh, with regard to the particular theme that we're talking about, absorbing young Asian graduates. And look, when we're talking about absorbing young graduates, we are often looking at it from the perspective of how they get absorbed within their respective national economies. But because this is an Asia meeting, is there a really a scope for countries to collaborate and actually develop that workforce for the region? What are your thoughts? Trent? So, I, I think it's at a, a level of the government. I think let's uh, look at the not the citizen of one country, how we no border among ASEAN countries and let free work Bless, right? You can travel, you can go anywhere in ASEAN, work together in any countries. 
So it means you have the, the talent, a, a big workforce for the ASEAN. So that is from the governments, I think, can work together and delete the border, right? Work meet very easy, visa, anything. That area one. The second, I think, opportunity for the association, industrial association, ASEAN Young Entrepreneurship Association. Let's work together and mapping with industry in competitive advantage up in each countries. And then we leverage the workforce together to exchange the workforce, to share the workforce, and to exchange the project, work together. So that is really very competitive advantage. The more efficiencies for that aspect. In education, I think work closely exchange among educational institutions together with enterprise. More strongly exchange the workforce students from the first year. Let them work, for, make the industry and make the major subject to support the industry outcome for three year time. So everybody have the job, right? Mapping strategic workforce planning in that part. And finally, uh, final words, I think I have, I like five words. A, B, C, D, E. A, agile. Agile in all the mindset we do at the government level or association or enterprise or startup. B, build from within. Focus on your talent work. Focus within the company. Care your people. Really work and build them, grow them together with you. Very important. C, very much on cooperation, partnership. Look at be young to your area, be young to your countries, and see all of us today, we can work together for future easily. No border, right? And D, digital. Every company become digital organization. That is the mission you have to go, right? E, empathy. Very important empathy. Put that in the compassion on anything we do to create the value for everybody, to bring the value for communities. Fantastic. Trina, very, very forward-looking, very interesting suggestions. I'd like to quickly, I think uh, we have just about a minute or a couple of minutes only to wrap up. So I'd like to have it sounds suggestion on a more collaborative way for Asian countries to come together on workforce management. Yeah, thank you, Rajiv. I think uh, what is missing in the baby boomers' time and my time was the synergy. Uh, in the past, we are too much have uh, spent all the energies, spend time, just to fight to get to be able to be a more competitive way. So in the new future, in today and then tomorrow, there will be no uh, competitions. Uh, there, it is more your internal competitions basically. Right. So you have to work together. You have to work in uh, countries by countries because there is no border of the countries anymore. So everything what happened to to Vietnam, for example, it's also happened to Indonesia, and what happened to to India as well. So the things that because of these collaborations, especially in Asian, because in uh, in, in terms of the uh, perspective of the investors, they have no investment landed anymore be beside Asians. So Asians is the only focus brand because Africa is enough already saturated probably. And then Asians, they have more uh, development and they have more chance. And then the risk is also uh, better compared to uh, some part of the African countries. So I think... This is about the time that we sit together, how to think that we can collaborate, like uh, what Trin tried to say, that the association is one of the key, mm -hmm. but also uh, the government, we did already with the government interactions and so on, but we need to be more active, not in the intergovernmental, uh, not to be in the political way, but it's more to really do some things for the nations. I think that's my I'll have to just share, you know, because we just have about a minute. I think, Nalan, you'll have the final word on this. Yeah, I, I think every country has to take care of its own workforce first. All this cooperation is nonsense. It's not going to happen, especially in COVID times. Only in the highest level where there's skill gap and lowest level where you need manual labor do mm -hmm. people import talent. Okay. Companies should stop grieving about this thing and stop doing CSR and adopting some village in Africa or some girl child somewhere else. Mm -hmm. They should do upskilling, reskilling of the graduates in their own country and co-opt universities. Instead of adopting villages, they should start co-opting universities and put their money where their mouth is. 
All right. So I think we've had an amazing session. I think we've just run out of time. I would really like to thank Nalin, Itsan, and Trin for your amazing observations. It made this session so wonderful. There are many takeaways. I would, I was thought, thinking of uh, listing them, but I think it's run out. I'm sure we have the recording of the session itself for people to recover, to, uh, you know, refer to. Many, many thanks for your time today. And I think it was a fabulous time for me to actually moderate this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank, Thank you, Thank you, you. Very good Thank question. You, Thank, Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank nice you, to see you. Yeah. Later. Thank you, Trin. Thank you, Rajiv. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, all. Bye-bye.